My name is Roxanne Panchassi, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of History at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada. Um, and we have, uh, welcome to what we talk about when we talk about decolonisation. Uh, I, um, I'm just going to open up with a couple of comments and then introduce our panel members. In the last decade and more, there's been an explosion of historical research and writing focused on the French Empire and its legacies. This work has included the examination of decolonization as a complex set of events, a historical process, and a contested politics that figures and struggles with the meanings of imperial pasts, the nature of independence, and the aftermaths of colonialisms from eras of conquest to a range of distinct and incomplete endings. This roundtable session brings together a group of scholars, who I'll introduce in a few moments, um, whose recent work takes different approaches to the study of decolonization, drawing on a diversity of archives in France, Algeria, Southeast Asia, and beyond, while emphasizing thematics that include religious identities and institutions, the mobilities and memories of communities and diaspora, and the ideologies and political dynamics of revolution revolutionary movements and emergent states. So anchored around a series of key words, um, so there's Raymond Carver in the title and Raymond Williams in the structure. <laughs> um, uh, this session's gonna explore the, the approaches to and interrogations of decolonization at the heart of the work these scholars do and have done and are, will continue to do, um, considering the current state of the field and exploring its possible futures. Um, so the plan is, after I introduce the four members of our panel, uh, we're going to have a series of keywords. I'll ask a, a question kind of anchored around that keyword or phrase uh, and targeting one participant in particular to begin with, but one that not targeting in a violent way. <laughs> <laughs> Aimed at? That doesn't help. Um, uh, tar you know, addressed, addressing one participant in particular, but uh, with, a, with a view to making connections with some of the other participants, sometimes all four, sometimes two, sometimes three, and really anybody can jump in uh, with additional comments or questions uh, to add to the conversation as you wish and as you feel like. And then we'll save comments and questions from the audience till the end, and we'll try to keep about 20 or 30 minutes for that part, okay? So I'll start with Jeffrey Byrne, who is an associate professor in the Department of History at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Jeff specializes in the international and global history of the post-colonial world with a particular interest in South-South connections. Jeff received his PhD from the London School of Economics in 2011. He has published articles in journals such as International History Review, Diplomatic History, and the International Journal of Middle East Studies. I'm just going to try to move here. His first book, Mecca of Revolution, Algeria, Decolonization, and the Third World Order, was published by Oxford in 2016. Sung, Sung, am I saying that right? <laughs> Sung Choi um, is an assistant professor in the Department of History at Bentley University in Waltham, Massachusetts. She's a specialist in modern France, immigration, national identity, empire, and settler colonialism. Sung received her PhD from UCLA in 2007. She's published journal articles in French politics, culture, and society, and the Journal of North African Studies. Her first book, Decolonization and the French of Algeria, Bringing the Settler Colony Home, was published by Paul Grave in 2015. Katie Edwards, I've got her up there as Catherine, but she goes by Katie, um, is an assistant professor in the Department of History at Tulane University in New Orleans. Katie is a specialist of contemporary France and the second overseas empire with a strong interest in historical remembrance. She received her PhD from the University of Toronto in 2010. Katie has published articles in the journals French Colonial History and Hagar. Her first book, Contesting Indochina, French Remembrance Between Decolonization and Cold War, examines the French memory of the Indochina War from 1945 to 1954. And it was published by the University of California Press in 2016 theme here. <laughs> Darcy Fontaine is an assistant professor in the Department of History at the University of South Florida in Tampa, a specialist in French colonial history and the period of decolonization. Understood in a global frame, she's broadly interested in thinking about morality, ethics, and religion. She's published articles in the International Journal of Middle East Studies and French Politics, Culture, and Society. Her first book, Decolonizing Christianity, Religion and the End of Empire in France and Algeria, 1940 to 1965, was published by Cambridge in 2016. Okay, so we're gonna start with the invention of decolonization. 
Um, and it's a little weird. <laughs> because um, <laughs> Todd is here. <laughs> um, but um, essentially, I want to start with the question for all of you, but starting with Darcy, because you've got the gerund, decolonizing, about how you came to your interest in working on decolonization and how you are, just in a broad sense, because obviously we're going to be talking about this the whole time, using and interrogating the term uh, in your research and writing. And I just want to flip through a few. So there's Todd. <laughs> and then I went, Google Images is kind of awesome for, Okay, Darcy. How I came to how you decolonization. came to work on decolonization okay. and why decolonizing or how decolonizing. Why decolonizing. So I did my PhD at Rutgers along with others in the room, <laughs> including Roxanne and Todd. <laughs> Um, and I came to decolonization fairly late in the process, actually. I went to Rutgers to work with Bonnie Smith and do a project about transnational gender history. And it was in my third year, as I was taking exams and sort of finishing projects, and the f initial project I went to do fell apart. Um, and I was working in an African history seminar and doing a project about missionaries in Kenya. And somebody had asked about a, a transnational connection with the French Empire and um, had gone to do primary source research at the New York Public Library and stumbled on a pamphlet um, that sort of forms the introduction to my book about this French researcher who was talking about these uh, Christians in Algeria who had sort of destroyed Christianity in Algeria by helping the FLN. And I was really intrigued by this uh, question about what, what Christianity, what role Christianity had played in the Algerian War and in decolonization, and that's how I came to this project, in fact. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of started on the research of that project and was working with particular, in fact, it was with the groups that were sort of cited in this pamphlet as being the ones that had incited the end of Christianity in Algeria. Um, CIMAD, a Protestant aid group, um, and these specific Catholic Catholics that were named in this uh, pamphlet that I started looking at, and I had spent a year, uh, Fulbright year in France, doing research there, and it had taken a long time to get access to Catholic archives. In fact, a year, really, to get into these Catholic archives. And then I had gone to Algeria to do research, and I think it was in the process of doing this research that I kind of stumbled on this title of decolonizing, because it was thinking about the role of Christians in the Algerian war, but also this process of uh, Christianity itself being decolonized in, in the process of the Algerian war and decolonization being tied into what the Protestants were doing with the World Council of Churches at this moment and also Vatican II as this process that was taking place through political decolonization as these Christians really thinking through what, it, what decolonization was going to mean to Christianity more broadly mm -hmm. and thinking about decolonization not necessarily something that ended with independence both as a political process, I think a lot of us have been thinking this through, um, but also through the institutions of Christianity as this longer term process that would need to take place over decades, even. And what about the rest of you? Is it, <coughs> how have you kind of either struggled with the term or been fine with the term? Or, um, yeah, and how did you come to it? Does anybody else want to add to that? Katie, you look like you have something to say. <laughs> sure. I mean, in my case, I'm really looking much more at how the, the major actors in my story are themselves constructing what decolonization was all about. Um, and so in some ways, it's, it's about how that term or that process is being appropriated and deployed and um, how it's being deployed specifically in contrast to narratives specifically about the Cold War. Um, so how narratives about decolonization and the Cold War kind of map onto each other or are used for very different purposes to advance different agendas. Jeff, do you want to say anything? Uh, well, I look at decolonization as a um, po political project, an international political project, uh, and a means by which um, certain people inhabiting the late colonial world uh, get to become elites by participating in this process of decolonization. Uh, and I focus on Algeria. Uh, and one thinks of the Algerian war as being a war of national liberation and decolonization being an inherently confrontational process. And that's certainly true, but there's also a negotiated aspect to decolonization. Um, so in some respects, I look at the um, sort of the conservatism of decolonization in international structural terms. Mm 
and the way that certain people, in this case the leaders of the, or at least some leaders of the Algerian FLN, get to become uh, the leaders after independence and relate to other people around the colonial world that have had a similar experience. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to move on to Sung, but not necessarily with a focus on how you use the word or the term. But you all work on different players in different contexts. Um, and I'm, I'm really glad, actually, that you know, Katie was able to join us so that we wouldn't have an all Algeria panel, because that happens a lot <laughs> when, we, when we talk about decolonization or even uh, empire these days. So um, I'd like to ask you all, but beginning with Sung, about the historical actors and agents that figure centrally in your research and writing, um, and especially about the different narratives of their roles and the events that your work uh, traces. I'm also interested in the categories that a number of you pursue uh, and how you negotiate some of the well, moralizing labels that either the people themselves are using or fighting against, um, that historians have used, and that we might still be using to think about different historical players. So, and these are just three of them, you know, victims, perpetrators, heroes, com comes up in, the heroic comes up in, in a lot of, well, all of you actually deal with heroes or the question of heroes. Sung, would you like to start? Sure. Um, actually, this question connects to how I came to become interested in decolonization. My life is divided between my home country of origin, which is South Korea, and the United States. And I received my adolescent and early adult education all in South Korea. And what frustrated me about that was because of the Japanese colonization of Korea in 1910 to 1945, um, starting with my family members, a whole country, the whole education system was grounded in cultivating a nationalist view of history, that this was a nationalism, liberation, anti-imperial, anti-Japanese. All education of Japanese culture was banned, manga was banned, anime was banned. Mm -hmm. um, there was only one university teaching the Japanese language. So for me, um, instead of looking at the colonized side, I was always interested in looking at the colonizer side. I was that sort of, um, ironically, the whole prohibition of learning about the other got me very interested in the other. <laughs> and then I had grown up in the United States, and I always wanted to come back to continue higher education here. So when I came back um, and continued at first the University of Chicago and then UCLA, I was surprised to see that there wasn't that much study going on on decolonization and post-colonial studies. There were subaltern studies and in Indian historians were doing that, but among Europeans it was still very much a um, cultural history of the 19th century. Um, very few people were teaching 20th century European history. Um, but I began reading a uh, the books about colonization and how, um, at that time, Ann Stoller's publication was being widely read. By the time I got to um, thinking, well, everyone is interested in how colonial institutions are built up. If that's the case, what happens when colonialism as a system ends? What happens to those institutions? What happens to the colonists? Mm -hmm. And then when I propose a topic relative to what happened in France after Algeria, um, Todd Shepard had come and um, his dissertation was done. And then at that time, he had just, I think, was beginning to publish his um, book. And so I, I very much was influenced by Todd's work. And I think I wrote a lot of my dissertation under his that book's influence and the kind of questions it raised. So I think all of us um, come out of that uh, decade where questions about colonialism and decolonization was no longer about victims and perpetrators, mm -hmm. clearly cut, but um, the pulling apart of the systems and how these pre, you know, empires reconfigured their post-empire nationhood. and. Um, notions of who they were now that their whole identity wrapped around empire had dissolved. So it's very much in line of the kind of inquiry that um, Todd began. And um, what ended up happening was I was so obsessed with that book that I had to figure out a way where I could <laughs> create my own story independently of Todd. And one thing that I came up with is as I was reading, um, as everyone knows, that book is very much focused on the 60s, so I thought, why not take this further and try to extend the story? And it, 
And um, the, the flaw and strength of what doing that, of course, is that you're looking at a very long period and you're writing a book on that very long period. So I think a lot of the kind of critiques around my narrative has been that it covered a lot in a very short um, book. So um, I find that there's a lot of questions um, that allowed me to, that, that came up precisely because I was looking at a much longer period. Um, and so that was how I kind of ended up writing the book and coming to the story of decolonization. Maybe do you want to um, speak to this question of the heroic, <laughs> especially? <laughs> Sure, I mean, uh, the heroism is a central part of the narratives about the Indochina War, really on both sides, because on the one side you have um, veterans who uh, are depicted and depict themselves as heroes, but not just as heroes, as martyrs in particular, uh, who frame their whole experience as um, not having fought a war, a colonial war, a war of decolonization. That's not what this was about. This was about protecting our Indo-Chinese brothers from the horrors of communism. And so uh, in that framework, anyone who died during the course of the Indochina War, or even who, who fought and survived, is by definition a hero or a, a martyr for a much bigger crusade, a much bigger cause. Mm -hmm. uh, but then on the, the other end of the spectrum, you have those uh, who have constructed a narrative of the war that is much more focused on it as a colonial war that was illegitimate, that sought to repress national independence. Um, and there you have a very different kind of heroism, which is the heroism of those who were uh, standing up to the French. Um, and both of those narratives are deployed, I would say, not quite in equal measure because the anti-communist narrative has very much carried the day for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's changed more recently, but um, it is interesting to see how not just heroism, but also the idea of who are the victims, who are the perpetrators, uh, plays out in different ways in both of those narratives, too. Mm -hmm. Darcy, do you want to say anything about? Sure. Um, I mean, my, my story is much more limited in the sense that I'm looking mostly at one community of Christians, but that they are depicting each other as heroes and perpetrators within that, so you can't, what I'm trying to argue is that you can't simply say Christianity was one thing or another, but in fact they both groups were using uh, both the sort of theology of Christianity and Christianity as an ideology to justify their political positions within the Algerian war. Um, and there was both sort of a, an ideology of heroism on both sides of this as a kind of political project, both to defend French Algeria um, as a Christian and anti-communist project and then to uh, side with the FLN as a you know, sort of leftist Christian project. So it becomes part of this yeah. deconstruction of these myths within that. I know ideology. you have heroism in your, uh, in your book, <laughs> Jeff, but I want to bring you in to um, talk about this term that both you and Darcy use explicitly, but maybe um, Katie and uh, Sung have thoughts on this as well. This, the, the return to the third world in the title of the book, but also your, um, like throughout the work that you do, I guess, yeah, how do you think about the notion of the third world, the, 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 the phrase, the use of it, um, the continued usefulness of it, um, and how it operates in your work? Um, so, sorry, am I talking about the third world or heroism? Well, no, I'm just, we're talking about the third world. Okay. We can certainly uh, talk about heroism and the third world. <laughs> third world heroism, I guess, is uh, that maybe the two go together. Um, yeah, well, uh, I've taught several courses now uh, at UBC that have third world in the title. And whenever you propose a new course, it sort of has to go through several layers of, of uh, bureaucratic approval. Um, and the, I never got any pushback on anything, except every layer it goes through, I always get the same queries like, third world, can we, can we use that term? Is that, is that politically correct? And I always say yes, and so it goes ahead. Um, but then, so, you know, I have this uh, discussion then with my students about the term third world and uh, so on what it means. Um, so uh, the third world is, you know, it's one of these terms that acquires a life of its own, especially in the more contemporary period, but it's, it's a specific project, political project and economic project um, conducted by, coordinated by sort of uh, nationalist and post-colonial elites and actors. So it's, it's, you can historicize the third world as a 
um, at least the, the aspect of it I'm looking at as a, as a mobilizing theme, an organizing theme uh, in the 60s and 70s. Uh, and I don't think it's the term third world, I don't think at all it has lost any of its, or at least not all of its um, uh, positive connotation in a lot of, uh, you know, much of Africa and the Middle East. Uh, I feel like there's still a lot of that, that the term doesn't have the way sort of North American students think third world means third race or starvation or something. Um, I think Bono basically wrecks the term <laughs> <laughs> for the English speaking world. But, um, so I'm trying to fight back against that as a fellow Irishman. But um, yeah, and it's, you know, it's, it's tied into this era, this era of um, theme of heroicism and it's sort of the heroic era, I suppose, looking at the 60s is the real um, heroic era and the immediate post-colonial moment and all this optimism and expectation. Um, one of the challenges is uh, not writing these sort of um, negative predetermined histories of a history of the third world, why it all goes badly and or sort of, you know, African post-colonial disappointment and disillusionment. Um, uh, so trying to avoid that while also acknowledging that things didn't quite um, work out the way a lot of people hoped. Um, in terms of heroism, it's, it's, it's interesting looking at uh, sort of the leaders of the FLN and because they're heroes at the time and themselves, of course, constructing these narratives of heroism, uh, but are seen as the bad guys, at least by a lot of people now, these uh, mm. post-colonial elites who, I mean, the current president was the foreign minister in the 60s. Uh, it's a country taken over by mostly 20 and 30 year olds and a lot of them stay in power. So they remain around long enough to become the sort of um, demonized forces that the sort of Arab Spring and the youth and people in the West sympathetic to, at least their understanding of those things, sort of see them as the, the bad guys. Um, so I don't know, it's, it's um, heroicism is a, a political force. Um, and there's a lot that I admire in some of them, to be fair, but I try to get away from um, judging them too much. Mm -hmm. Darcy, it seems to me that yours is the other book that really explicitly uses the phrase, right. the term. Well, I think the, there's a Christian left that really jumps on board the, the idea of the third world, particularly in the 60s. There's a, there's a whole movement. Mm -hmm. And then I think like Eleanor Davies sort of picks up on this, picks up on this too with the humanitarianism as it emerges in the mm -hmm. 68. And I think the Christians sort of form that link between what Jeff is doing uh, talking about this, you know, the third world as a, as a coming out of uh, places like Algeria and Egypt and so forth, and then the way that the French left picks it up later in the 60s. And I think a lot of these, these sort of Christians really form that bridge between the two. Mm -hmm. um, so going back to Katie as my target, <laughs> um, <laughs> both you and Jeff really um, engage the history and historiographies of the, the <coughs> Cold War in, in your works. Um, so the two of you in particular, you know, place a great deal of emphasis on Cold War politics and are making interventions with respect to the historiography of the Cold War in relationship to decolonization in your work. So I wonder if you could start us off talking about how Cold War and decolonization come together in, in the work that you're doing. Yeah, and the, that's what makes, um, I think, the Indochina War such an interesting co uh, case study because globally, decolonization and the Cold War are interacting with each other. That's, that's inevitable, but um, f not just for the French, but especially for the French, the Indochina War is both of those things happening at the same time, and they get conflated with one another. Um, and even when you try and present a neat and tidy packaging of the first phase of the war was a more of a colonial war and the second phase was more Cold War, it doesn't really work that easily <laughs> um, because they are processes that are feeding one another very much so. Um, and I think because most of my study focuses on the post-war period, that's where you really see these two contexts being instrumentalized to pursue particular agendas, particular narratives. And I think, uh, you see up until the collapse of the, the Eastern Bloc, um, the Cold War context, the ongoing Cold War context, uh, causes people to define the Indochina War in particular ways. Um, so in other words, they're not removing themselves from the context at all, but then even after the Soviet Bloc collapses, you still have the phenomenon of relying on a Cold War framework to explain everything, even when it's no longer all that appropriate to do so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think maybe I'll let yeah. Jeff speak and um, yeah, and I suppose in terms of my uh, 
graduate training and the sort of immediate environment that I grew up in was very sort of international history, Cold War oriented and so on. Uh, and I think it's inextricable from the story and is very much instrumentalized by, um, uh, as you're just saying, by a lot of uh, third world uh, actors. I um, um, forgot just quite what I was going to say now. But uh, I mean, one of the, I suppose, uh, why I think, or at least one of the vital um, dynamics between the Cold War and decolonization is that the Cold War helps define what decolonization is. Decolonization is also invented in the colonies. Uh, people such as the Algerian FLN, if they start telling the Algerian people we, we want decolonization, they have to say what that is. Uh, so I think the Cold War is, um, or at least this is a theory I had that I wrote about uh, at one point in, a, in an article. Um, helps decolonization come to mean, as it does very quickly in the late 50s uh, and early 60s, come to mean independent nation states, sovereign states. Uh, and I think one of the reasons for that is that the Cold War um, is actually a very nationalist nation state. It's a very, it's, in many ways, it's a very uh, conservative uh, and homogenizing um, dynamic in terms of international structures. American policymakers and even Soviet policymakers, despite their ideology, they're looking at the world and they see the world as sort of a risk map, um, the board game risk, I mean, as countries. And so uh, I think what's often neglected is that sort of terrorists, revolutionaries, insurgents, and so on, they're not powerful. They do what they can. And if new opportunities arise, they take those opportunities. Uh, and so you have people who are opposed to the imperial status quo. Uh, and they see opportunities to get international support. But if you go to the Americans and say, I represent the caliphate, as actually people have done in more recent years, they think that's absurd. Uh, these days, they've been innately hostile to it. Maybe 50 years ago, they would have just laughed and not know what you're talking about. If you come and say you're uh, representing a nation, you're fighting for national liberation, that's something they understand. Mm. So you have to define yourself as a nationalist and say you want independence. If the Americans are even going to sort of take you seriously, let alone whether they'll give you support. And surprisingly, the same happens uh, with the Soviets, despite uh, communist ideology. So I think there's the power dynamics and the hierarchical power dynamics that a lot of um, people opposed to imperialism, uh, anti-imperialist activists, who maybe even as late as the early, mid-50s, certainly a lot of African contexts, aren't actually even thinking about sort of nation statism and so on in that sense. And they quickly come around to it because that's the language that gives you power. Mm -hmm. um, and it's an opportunity you can't afford to pass up. Otherwise, you'll become a footnote in history. Um, it also seems to me that uh, all of you, in different ways, even though I guess it's Darcy who does it most explicitly, I just have to paint to <laughs> that picture, um, are engaging in some type of provincializing in your work. So you talk about provincializing Christianity, Darcy, but um, you know, when I was thinking about all of your research and writing, the, the notion that at some level, Katie, you know, you're provincializing our privileging of Algeria <laughs> in the stories of colonialism and decolonization, or that some you're dealing with, um, you know, the ways in which maybe, uh, you know, repatriates are deprovincializing themselves, um, and that in, in, in terms of, the, and, and kind of arguing for a different kind of uh, perspective on, on the colonial past. And then, of course, the South-South dynamics of your book, Jeff, and your work are, are making provincializing, make provincializing moves as well. So um, maybe starting with Darcy, that notion of provincializing. I don't have a, pe a, cop a picture of Deepesh Chakrabarty's book right now. But, but um, how you think about it as a, as a framework for your work uh, and how the rest of you do that as well. Um, yeah, well, a lot of it was just a lot of the arguments and narratives about um, what was important about what French people were doing in the Algerian war were centered in metropolitan France, and have been for a long time, whether it was intellectuals, Christians, all kinds of things, and in particular in the left. And going back to heroic narratives about who was anti-torture, who supported Algerian independence, all of these kinds of things were all about what people in France did. And um, so in my argument about provincializing was saying, well, there were a lot of people in Algeria who did important things in the Algerian war. Maybe we should look at what they did and actually make a lot of claims that, in fact, what people in Algeria did was quite a bit more 
important to um, Algerian independence and to the, to the factors that uh, shaped policy and shaped uh, you know, Christian activism than what happened in France. Is that a dynamic in your work? Um, yeah, I was thinking back to the, today was all about, for me, decolonization, starting with 8 a.m., <laughs> Melissa's panel, all the way to uh, the, the panel before lunch with the flash round on Algeria. And I kept thinking how so many of us are working on very similar problematics, and there's probably more people working on decolonization in the audience than there are here. <laughs> so I can't wait to hear from the audience. But I would say provincializing, for me, was still very much about the French state. Um, that there was no set teleology to paths to decolonization. And it's one of the things reading decolonizing um, of the Algerian war that influence was really about showing how these powerful, once powerful empires had to quickly um, reconstruct themselves in a way that was not facing colonialism, but facing away from colonialism. Mm -hmm. And the whole project of decolonization for me was about, um, well, two things. One is reinserting the colonial past into the present. That is, as these um, post-colonies are weaning themselves away from their imperial past and recreating a uh, mythological post-colonial sovereign decolonized state, historians are really looking at how the colonial past still lingers and leaves these traces and legacies um, in all aspects of um, institutional life, everyday life, um, immigration, policies. Um, so to kind of track that path and showing how these states um, had to really figure out a way where they could not talk about colonialism anymore. So in that sense, the state, I think, was part of the provincialized mm -hmm. um, agent. Mm -hmm. Katie, do you want to talk about being a, a, a historian who works on Indochina right here <laughs> <laughs> on this panel, but also in general? Yeah, I mean, um, I think you might be giving me too much credit by assigning provincializing to what I'm actually doing with the book. So thank you for I that. I read them all but, together. So, um, but I do think, uh, I mean, globally in French historiography, Indochina has has for a long time been sort of underplayed, um, particularly when it comes to thinking about the repercussions of empire and the repercussions of decolonization. But that has certainly changed in the last. Um, decade and continues to do so, mm -hmm. uh, and even more so within Anglophone scholarship. So there's, you know, since the 60s and 70s, there's been a strong basis in French historiography, but we're starting to see that develop further with, with mm -hmm. a, a more global network of scholars, um, not to mention, of course, all of the, the Vietnamese and Lao and Cambodian scholars who are starting mm -hmm. to work on these questions, albeit with slightly different constraints, um, depending mm -hmm. on where they're working. Um, but it is, I mean, it. I started with a fascination with the French occupation, and then I moved to a fascination with the, Indo uh, with the Algerian War, um, <laughs> and not being able to find a dissertation topic that I thought was feasible in terms of working with remembrance and those topics. Uh, subsequently, of course, there have been plenty of amazing projects that have come out, but um, I was really intrigued by this idea of Indochina as being square in the middle of these two other periods that have gotten so much attention in terms of um, the instrumental instrumentalization of memory. Mm -hmm. uh, and so working on Indochina, I, I am either the one person on who has an Indochina connection on a panel of other people who are studying empire, usually Algeria. Um, but that gives me a lot of perspective to work with as well, mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of the models that I'm looking to in terms of the scholarship are people who are working on Algeria. Uh, and so I, I'm very much influenced by the work that's going on there. Uh, but obviously, there's, there's a very different pattern that emerges when it comes to the Indochina War. Um, and very occasionally, I'm in groups that are focused much more on Southeast Asia. And was just recently at a conference where there are a lot of parallels to be drawn with uh, the Indonesian War of Independence. Mm. Uh, because there are, I mean, obviously a war of decolonization, but there are so many similarities there, including the broader dynamics of the Cold War as they were playing out in Southeast Asia, um, following on the heels of a somewhat common experience of Japanese occupation. Mm -hmm. uh, and so building up those links, I think that's sort of the next step is to be looking at uh, across, um, looking across empires and decolonizations um, in yeah. much the same Speaking way that you're actually. So this is your first Society <laughs> for French Historical Studies meeting. <laughs> That's what I was just thinking. How do you feel surrounded by French historians? 
Um, I feel provincialized. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I didn't come to the issue um, sort of well versed in um, uh, that sort of theory. Um, to a certain extent, it just it seemed obvious to me. It's a big world. Um, if countries like Algeria, if countries like Algeria aren't important, then the country I come from is completely, you know, not even worth remembering the name of. Um, so um, I think it's 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 easier if you come from a place that's not sort of heavily, it's not coming from a sort of particular narrative or sense that even places like France and Britain, let alone the United States or or so on, a sense that you have some sort of you're not viewing the world through a certain there's no um, uh, even unconscious sort of geostrategic uh, legacy there that's sort of uh, suffused among the general populace. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, where, where it's become quite interesting to me is not only sort of which conferences and organizations am I supposed to go to and be a, a member of, um, but uh, the, the way in which um, sort of place terms and geographic identities and the presumed uh, sort of cultural connotations that go with them, uh, that has, um, that can be very contentious in decolonizing and post-colonial countries. Um, and in the, in the Algerian case, one, I mean, I suppose it, it came down to what struck me uh, particularly about a lot of third world is diplomacy, because there's so many meetings, you know, there's Afro-Asian meetings, and there's Afro-Asian economic meetings, and Afro-Asian social meetings, and Afro-Asian cultural meetings, and non-aligned meetings, and online economic meetings, and online <laughs> cultural meetings, and um, Arab League meetings, and uh, Organization of African Unity meetings, and so on and so forth. And these, there's these things happening all the time. Uh, and part of that is that it's sort of, it's sort of um, identity politics. It's diplomacy. Is a, it, there's the, the assumption, which I th maybe it was obvious, but didn't occur to me in hindsight, that people seem to assume as, after independence that your foreign policy reflected your values and nature and culture. Uh, so the, in the Algerian context, a sort of concrete example is a lot of people get to the Algerians supported all sorts of national liberation movements and revolutionary movements uh, after independence, but people getting upset if it seemed like they were supporting movements from Africa, um, sort of southern Africa, more than, say, the Palestinians, because that suggested, wait, are we more African? Are we more Francophone then? Or is that uh, underplaying? Or th th this, um, and there, so, that, so there had to be sort of a carefully, careful balancing and uh, sort of uh, ritualistic aspect to it. Uh, in that sense, in terms of trying to overcome um, not just the sort of uh, Western area studies um, uh, dynamic, which certainly apply, but also from um, within their own publics, sort mm -hmm. of what our place in the world is and who we're talking to, in theory, reflects our innate identity, which in a lot of post-colonial contexts is highly contentious. There's, they don't, there's not really the sense of sort of the popular sense of uh, what's that um, in American politics? That sort of uh, politics ends at the shore, or something that you know foreign policy as realist and not reflective. It's you know interest-based. That doesn't seem to be the popular assumption mm. after independence, at least in a lot of countries. A central kind of theme, organizing principle of your book, Song, is this notion of repatriation politics. And again, re thinking about all of your work together, it was always interesting for me, like I'd sort of write down you know, a central theme or thing that I wanted to ask about or talk about, and then realize that it sort of you know, bounced around in, in, in the work of the rest of you, even if you weren't using the term or framing things that way. So could you say a little bit, Sung, about repatriation politics and maybe the rest of you who feel like that resonates with the work that you're doing could, could respond as well? Yeah, as I was saying, as I was extending the timeline of how far this would stretch, um, I end in the early 2000s. Um, and what surprised me was the resilience of this category of repatriates. As everyone here would know, it refers to the um, people living in the colonies who are then leaving the colonies to come back to France. And of course, the problem was that for the settlers in Algeria, that Algeria being part of France, that was not the case. They were coming back. They were leaving one part of France for another. Um, but how does this, how did this very um, misleading and, and skewed category then survive for so long was quite, it told me a lot about how policies survive, how policies that 
um, you would think uh, based on a very false uh, notion of who these people were could remain resilient and they were so much invested in keeping this category going. Um, I was intrigued by how the um, category itself drove uh, not only the state's view of these people, but the people's own then um, uh, impulsion to adopt this category, um, and have it forced on them, but um, as citizens interacting with the state, they were compelled to submit to this category in some way, even though they personally would be opposed to it. So it was looking at the interaction using this category as a register through which the state and the people from uh, Algeria were interacting, and that's how I kind of uh, threaded the narrative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess the most obvious pairing here is with Katie, um, you know, just in terms of when I was thinking about your mm -hmm. book, thinking about framing it also in terms of a repatriation politics that mm -hmm. also illuminates the other politics or the rest of the politics the other of the French state. Yeah, and, and of the French state, too, right. during this period that you're covering in the book. Right, so uh, one of the chapters of my book examines um, Franco-Indo-Chinese repatriates, so French citizens of Indo-Chinese heritage, who then fall somewhere between the Pied Noir and the Arqui in a certain way, yeah, except that they're not military, so the Arqui reference doesn't work quite as well. But mm. um, there you have also the f one of the first experiences of this repatriation, even though, again, it's French citizens who've never been to France, so it's, it's not exactly a repatriation. Uh, but it's clear that from 1950 on, the, the French state is very concerned about what might happen, how many people might come, where are we going to put them? Uh, and it, you have people already beginning to arrive from Morocco and Tunisia, but Indochina is the first sort of phase of decolonization, so that first wave, even though it's so much smaller, and it, because it's so much smaller, it obviously got far less attention. Um, in fact, the, neither the Vietnamese state, because most of these repatriates were leaving from Saigon, but the Vietnamese state, the Vietnamese press, the French press, the French state, nobody's really paying a whole lot of attention to them. Um, but you see so many of the same processes and the same kinds of questions about assimilation, um, these camps that are built to house them, uh, which work against any kind of principle of assimilation because they're located in the middle of nowhere for the most part. Mm -hmm. uh, but those same questions that are raised about the integration possibilities of especially the Aki and their families, uh, you see those raised in this context too. Um, only what you also see is a shift as more and more Aki are arriving and as the Algerian uh, migrant labor force grows, uh, all of a sudden the repatriates from Indochina who are deemed um, unassimilable are, they, they turn into the model minority that we've come to sort of identify with Asian populations generally in France and elsewhere in the world. But um, the, it, you can see the process in the archives where all of a sudden the repatriates from Indochina, they're great uh, because at least they're not Arab. Um, so that you see not just the, in other words, I think that chapter sheds light not only on a different aspect of repatriation, but also how repatriation politics, when it comes to identity politics, how those two those processes play off of one another and shape each other. Darcy, I think of your work in some ways as being about the politics of staying. Um, right. Mm -hmm. So, discuss. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'm working against a lot of the, the narrative of the repatriates in France who have long dominated the story of what happened at the end of the Algerian War and how everybody, all the European settlers had to leave and they were forced out for a variety of reasons, um, because I'm looking at the Christians who stayed and how and what the conditions were in that context um, and sort of challenging in some ways that narrative of the of why people left and examining who left and what, why. So um, yeah, thinking about what, what were the conditions of repatriation and, and I'm, I, for there's, I'm sure there will be lots of interesting challenges to this. I'm framing it as a choice more than an absolute necessity. Does the, the figure of the expelled matter a lot in your work? It's like from the Algerian perspective, I guess I mean. Um, or the, the expelled? The, of, of those who stay or the, like, did that, does that come up in your work, Jeff? And um, those who were pushed, like, the, and the and the, the heroism around making people leave, right? I just think of that. Uh, well, it's not. I mean, it's not a huge part. I feel like um, my expertise on this theme is uh, minor compared to uh, people around me and a lot of people in the room. 
Um, but uh, I mean, I suppose it ties into sort of um, um, identifying the nation and who belongs in the nation. Uh, I mean, one of the interesting things I found um, uh, in the French archives, actually, where they had uh, audio recordings of a lot of the imprisoned FLN leadership, um, uh, or actually, no, maybe it was something else. But anyway, uh, late towards uh, the war, qu quite a few of the people who would become very important after independence were amongst themselves saying quite explicitly, oh, well, we want all the French to leave, all the Pierre Noir to leave. And we're, we're negotiating otherwise in the Evin Accords, but later on we'll get rid of them. So um, that was at least one school of thought amongst people who ended up being mm -hmm. very influential. So they were, I think they were quite relieved in some ways that it happened and they weren't blamed for it mm -hmm. uh, in the summer. Um, the other interesting thing I came across uh, in that context is um, documents about policy relating to um, emigration um, to France in the late 60s and early 70s and how uh, the Algerian government preferred that Kabyles, they encouraged sort of Kabyles to emigrate. Uh, and they talk about it expressly as an economic export because they send back remittances and they felt like their authority in Kabylia was always sort of um, a source of unrest for them. So they were getting rid of troublemakers while, you know, in a way it was a way, it was a way of sort of getting rid of some of the most discontented people while they in turn were sending money directly back to Kabylia, which was sort of perhaps helping with economic development there. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it was a problem that solved itself. In many ways, actually, um, the, uh, the contestation over Algerian oil and gas in the early 70s, one of the things that the Algerians were really pushing back on against the French government and sort of nationalizing things and unilaterally imposing price hikes, this is even before 73, were, were um, French policies with regards to, as the Algerians sort breaking promises to import French wine, but also breaking promises about immigration. Mm -hmm. So you were supposed to take wine and uh, immigrants. That was part of the deal. They were arguing, and if you're not going to honor that, then we're going to raise the price of oil. Mm. Um, which I guess is a different kind of thing, perhaps, than people are talking about. But. Um, so back to Katie. <laughs> but through the work that you're all doing, these issues of you know, forgetting amnesia, memory, commemoration, um, right up to the present, uh, is so they're so important. Um, can you get us started thinking about how that works for you in the in the research that you've done? And yeah, I think the other thing that sets um, the Indochina War apart, especially from the Algerian War, is that it's not been at the forefront of most people's consciousness for most of the period since 1954, uh, in the sense that studying the the memory of the Indochina War is studying something that's never really been firmly remembered by a majority of the population. You know, people know Dien Bien Phu, that means something, it's symbolically important, um, but there's no pattern comparable to this sort of people repress, there's amnesia, and then there's some kind of explosion of memory work. It, that doesn't happen in the same way. Um, but I think that also raises the importance of focusing not just on patterns, I guess, of remembering, but um, who is remembering? How are they remembering? Um, what are their objectives? Because in France in particular, there is this very strong commitment to devoir de mémoire, you know? And so how are, how are these agents trying to reach out to the general public? Why are, did they fail? Why did they succeed? Um, and more importantly, how are they instrumentalizing the past? And I think uh, that's, what I was hoping to get at uh, with my work is, is how are people making use of the past by commemorating it in particular ways. Um, and that's not new in the field, but I think there is, you know, now more than ever, people working on this idea of instrumentalization more than just how are, what are the patterns of remembrance. So if you look at Claire Eldridge's work, for example, it's, this, it's, it's similar, and Sung's work as well, is how are people making use of the past to advance particular agendas. Can you speak to that, Sung? Yeah, I actually had the privilege of reviewing Jeff's book, which was <laughs> very dense to get through. I'm sorry. And uh, <laughs> and I reviewed Claire Claire's book, and and um, the she deals a lot more with memory and forgetting than I and I do. And I were having worked mainly in the archives, it was really about policies and state and legislation mm -hmm. debates, whereas she really looked at the popular voices of the repatriates, the Pianoir and the Arqui, and um, 
how they were always in the active memory making business and since they arrived it wasn't a uh, project that began long after and what she really shows well is how pieces of memory um, kind of uh, get highlighted depending on the domestic politics or international events that are going on at the time so um, I I have to say that part was dealt much more in depth by, by her book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mine was mainly really looking at the state's politics. So in some ways I'm in dialogue with Claire because her work um, really shows what's going on at the uh, level outside of the state. And I'm really looking how, how the state really tries to control these projects of commemoration mm -hmm. um, from the moment they arrive until, you know, until the present day and how it really sort of um, recreates its own narrative of how it saw decolonization and defines decolonization and tries to leave those popular memories um, uh, at a distance. So, yeah. Darcy, do you want to speak to commemoration at all? I don't know, too much. Memory of? Memory of? Your, the people you work on. <laughs> I mean, I'm I most, was thinking yeah. of the monastery story. At the, you know, the, oh, yeah. the, okay. Well, yeah, I mean, I sort of end my book with a story about the Tiberine monks, um, because this is a, obviously, maybe, if I say anything, I work on Christians in Algeria, people are like, oh, did you see the movie about the monks? And I'm like, <laughs> I did. <laughs> and then we end up talking about that. So I do it. <laughs> well, I don't want to make you do that. <laughs> we can forget about it. <laughs> That's okay. End with the story, because it, 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 <laughs> kind of frame it in that way because this um, the Catholics in Algeria are very obviously attached to the idea of the martyrdom of the Tiberine monks because it's it became that monastery which sort of became the symbol of why they were staying in Algeria after independence and like what what it meant for them to stay in Algeria through everything whether it was the war of independence after independence and through the 90s and so sort of talk <laughs> talk about that the ways we talk about the film later, <laughs> it's a different story. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of different kinds of memory that become attached to, I think, in that way it's a little bit less memory, but it is like a, a different kind of symbolism that in many ways has very little to do with Algeria. Because that was like an external Catholic world that became attached to that symbolism of mm -hmm. the martyrdom of the Tiberine monks. Mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting. Um, so you're all working with different uh, sources and archives <laughs> and, you know, voices and perspectives in, in the work that you do. <laughs> Many words on this. <laughs> um, but I guess I want to ask a question about, like, the practicalities of the work that you did uh, in terms of archival research um, and what you think is, uh, like, illuminated by the new material that you um, accessed, uh, how you accessed that material. And I, I guess I want to start with Jeff. Everybody always wants to know this story. Um, well, I can never share all aspects of it. But um, I mean, it's actually, in terms of sources and archives, that's probably one reason why this is the first time I've been to this conference. Because <laughs> I was sort of um, uh, turned off the sort of French history scene uh, a bit during my uh, PhD. I mean, when I got started on this project, uh, I wrote to you know, a bunch of people who'd written good books on Algeria, a lot of whom were French, saying, I want to write this thing about it. At the time, I was thinking more of sort of Algerian foreign policy after independence. Um, do you have any advice for doing research in Algeria? And those that responded all said, why would you go to Algeria? Um, they're not going to let you see anything, and we've got lots of wonderful archives here. Have you been to the Chateau de Vincennes, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I said, well, OK, uh, but I'll give it a shot anyway. Um, and so things ended up working out for me uh, in Algiers over the long term. Uh, but in um, France, I got a lot more um, pushback for reasons I'm not entirely sure why. I got denied access to quite a few things. And every now and again, well, it hasn't happened for a while, but there was a, a, for a while I was getting emails from a couple of Italian uh, graduate students a few years back saying, who are you? And I was like, why do you want to know who I am? It's like, because I keep getting boxes at the uh, Archive Nationale in Paris that have little notes on them saying, do not give to Jeffrey Byrne. <laughs> um, so, and I didn't even publish anything at that point. So early on, they decided that I was 
you know, dodgy. And De Gaulle's okay. son would not let me see the De Gaulle papers, and the De Gaulle papers encompass a huge amount of stuff, even relating to relations with um, uh, independent Algeria, right up until 69. Um, it was all, or maybe it wasn't quite until 69, but it was handled by an office in the presidency, Algeria specifically, and that's still all largely classified, although a couple of other French historians have seen at least some of those things. Um, which is kind of why I was getting to that question earlier today, is that there's a very, still very concerted effort to not, even for post-colonial relations, to sort of keep that. It's under the personal control of de Gaulle's son. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, sources and archives, um, I mean, I, I approached things from a very, uh, it was very important to me and I was very glad that it worked out that I was able to get uh, a lot of stuff from the Algerian archives and be able to tell things from uh, that perspective more. But I, coming from this sort of international history approach, I was also getting stuff from, uh, I mean, another one that I was, uh, was very, might be useful to a lot of projects, actually, people don't uh, think about it, someone else put me onto it, are the former Yugoslavian archives. Because Yugoslavia had, um, Close relations with a lot of countries, especially post-colonial countries, that can be tricky to get at, and otherwise you're relying on sort of French or you know British or American or whatever stuff, um, and they can give you an, another a fresh take on that. Um, yeah, I guess I'd, my conclusion is I don't trust them in Paris. They don't like me for some reason. Does anybody else want to? Although talk the about uh, archivist at the foreign ministry. Um, approached me at a conference a couple of years ago and basically apologized and said I should come look at stuff, so. They took the notes out. <laughs> uh, well, no, that's the, that's the, oh, that's that's the, the Archive of National. Yeah, I think right. they still okay. don't like me. Um, what about in Algiers? You got all the stuff that the rest of us have seen. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I, um, Starcy. <laughs> <laughs> the question we all want to know. Well, it's, um, I mean, to a certain degree, um, there's some aspects of it where I have to protect people. Uh, so uh, I think some people took a risk. Um, for a couple of people, it was their own way of rebelling against the system uh, a little bit. Um, um, but that said, I mean, the, the, I mean, the main thing, I think, that why it worked out for me was just sort of insane uh, masochistic per perseverance, uh, really. Um, and um, coming back to the heroic stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I don't, still don't know to this day if I was an idiot to spend a large part of my 20s uh, in that reading room uh, trying to get stuff. But, um, you know, I'm glad it worked out, but <laughs> I could have been on a beach somewhere. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't, I mean, I think there's, I, I mean, I think there's still a lot to be gotten from the archives in Algeria. I mean, the, the central archives accumulate so much stuff. I mean, I saw stuff from, like all the ministries send stuff to them on a regular basis, except for the defense ministry and Sonatrack, which are laws unto themselves. But there's so much stuff that, a lot of it is just they haven't sorted it out at the archives, and they're sort of embarrassed to admit that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I kind of, in a sense, put myself to work cataloging stuff for them. Oh. <laughs> they told me I couldn't get anything after 1962. That's amazing. Um, does anybody else want to speak to the question of? I think he's being modest. I, having read every single word of this book, as <laughs> it, this, <laughs> and uh, I'm sorry. The, the, it's very impressive what Jeffrey um, collected, and what uh, he brought up Yugoslavia, but also what you did with the data was also very. Um, uh, interesting because there's new material on how the Algerians dealt with uh, Lumumba, dealt with radical figures that we were not aware of, at least I wasn't aware of. So how he mined those sources, he's being actually quite modest here, but um, sources I think are everything because my inclination was to look for policy so I naturally headed to the archives, but having read Claire's book, uh, you can do so much outside of the archives, and I think a lot of people are doing that now, looking at um, you know, personal archives, but also media, association documents, things that you can't really get at the archives, interviews. Um, this is a very 20th century history, that, and there are ways to access materials in an innovative way that doesn't mean you have to sit through boxes um, mm -hmm. necessarily. So I think a lot of this will involve also collaboration between those who are archive-based and those who are working outside doing field work in a very creative way now. 
Mm-hmm. I want to save the conversation about you know where this field is headed uh, for you know bringing the audience in, but the, the, I have to. We have to. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> I mean, it's like two days, and so um, I guess I, I do wonder, you know, because my students ask me this all the time, and I don't actually work on this stuff. I teach a class on um, the French-Algerian War, a seminar, and I use, like, all these people in the room. <laughs> I use your work for it, but, you know, to, to, to think about how your own work uh, might illuminate, well, this particular moment, um, or the politics of this moment and also how, you know, what your response was to Macron's <coughs> statement, given that you all work on this period and that. Okay, I didn't hear it yet. Um, well, so the, the notion of him, you know. Oh, uh, the colonial yeah, statement, not, yeah. not today. Okay. No, I'm not going to play it. I just assume, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I would say, not speaking about my own personal take on Macron, I mean, this statement was a contradiction of statements he's made previously, so I'm not entirely convinced about his commitment <laughs> to this idea uh, that colonization is a crime against humanity. He seems to be using it a little bit more sort of for um, shock value than, than mm -hmm. anything else, perhaps. Uh, but I think it does speak to this very important debate that's been happening in France over the legacies of colonialism. And so many of the people that I study use the Cold War as a way to avoid having that conversation hmm. because by casting decolonization of Indochina as something rooted in the Cold War, you don't have to address any of the other parts if you don't want to. Um, and that makes, uh, makes the conversation even more difficult to have in, some, in mm -hmm. some ways, especially when those who promote a very different view of the war are focusing on the war as a war of independence from an oppressive colonial system. So how do you, mm -hmm. uh, how do you confront that when you don't really want to deal with the colonial aspect at all? Mm -hmm. um, so it's, uh, it, the other aspect of this that is really interesting to me is, uh, you know, obviously the response Le Pen Fillon, this whole idea of we need to stop being uh, apologetic for everything we've ever done and we need to have a, we need to teach a history in school that is patriotic and that builds the nation up and that we're not teaching our students to be ashamed of their past. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole other conversation to have, I think. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it comes up in your, in your work too, some. Yeah, well, I mean, definitely the, some of this came up in the flash round conversation in, in the 8 a.m. panel as well. Um, when the commentator asked, is decolonization over? She phrased it that way, but I think um, all of us are working on projects that look at how um, colonial legacies are still um, filtered through the lens of political gain, political mm -hmm. motivations of power, um, paying lip service to this kind of thing, knowing that it's a big debate um, going on in the country showing just where France is. I think these are barometers to show how colonialism is being understood. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, the now with the terrorism incident and Charlie Hebdo and all of that, then the colors change to look at colonialism through the filter of those events. So uh, there's not a real grappling with what colonialism was. It's mainly trying to um, interpret it through different political dialogues that are happening around Events that talk about immigration, race, um, and that kind of uh, that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. I think we're pretty much on the same page on mm -hmm. that. Do you guys? Do you, do you two have anything you want to add to that? I think it's bad. I agree with them. <laughs> uh, I, I, one of the things that surprised me over the past few years, maybe it comes from teaching, is how um, animated these conversations still are, and how I mean, like sort of how many uh, white Anglo students in Canada you know, are desperate to hear a message that the British Empire wasn't so bad. And I think one of the more nefarious uh, things that have happened is that sophisticated academic work that looks at all the nuances and complexities of imperialism can then get seized upon by people saying, oh, look, it wasn't the Nazi Holocaust, therefore it wasn't all bad. That because everybody wasn't just killing each other every day, that, you know, any sort of historical nuance gets seized upon for um, sort of uh, right-wing purposes, I think. We have really different students. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Darcy, did you want to say something about that? I, I'll just say that I was looking for a really good website for my students to like explain the Algerian War, and I, a couple of days ago actually, and I stumbled on a brand new website from a defrocked French priest that was like far-right Catholic, 
um, that had just been translated into English and Dutch and Portuguese that was explaining all of the troubles of the modern world. And it had, <laughs> and all the great things, the theory of gender being <laughs> top of the list, second being what happened in Algeria. <laughs> and it had all my great actors that I write about in my book and various other things. And I was like, cool. This is like a thing again, <laughs> apparently. Yeah. But this was like this rallying point, and it had all of these you know, things that the Catholics, the French Catholics, needed to get back around, you know, deconstructing all of Vatican II, like the colonial stuff, gay marriage, all these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. It's like, all right, so this is apparently what the crazy Catholics are going <laughs> to rally around, the Algerian War. <laughs> so I think it's, there's, there's groups there that still well, I want to thank all it. of you to, for like, surviving <laughs> these questions, but also to bring in the people in the room now um, you know, who have comments or thoughts or questions for the members of the panel. My first? Okay. So, I mean, I was thinking about this initially when I was reading Jeff's book about how similar and also very importantly different, but how similar it was to Robert Malley's book on Algeria and the Third World, um, at least in the premise that Algeria is the focal point for thinking about the Third World and what it does in international politics. So I was wondering for all of you if, rather than thinking of books that sort of shaped you in a sort of like positive, constructive way where you're thinking in their positive legacy, um, <laughs> if there are books that you're either thinking of your work is writing over or re mm. rewriting, updating, or even like pushing back against as a negative example. Well, I could respond directly <laughs> to that one in the sense that uh, Mali's book when I was started uh, on the dissertation was, I was like, this is the book I don't want to write. Uh, what, part of what I'm trying to do is um, demystify Third Worldism and Bangdong and Afro-Asianism. I think there's too much stuff that's sort of written this sort of like gauzy, vague, approving way, um, but uh, sort of focuses on the atmospherics and just sort of conflates things: Afro-Asianism, non-alignment, and you know, Bangdong. It's all just sort of rolled together. Um, and it's. Uh, I feel like if you wrote about you know France or the United States or Britain or something in those terms, people would think it was um, you know very um, thin and uncompelling. Um, so hopefully one of you doesn't run away now and tell him that I said that. But um, I mean, I suppose the sort of the, the initial interest is the same, but I wanted to um, um, sort of demystify it and sort of get behind it and see what it actually was. Because I feel like, say, like the Bang Dung Conference now, there's this kind of recognition, if you're teaching, that that was an important thing. And you sort of have to tell your students that it was a terribly important event for reasons that you can't actually tell them why. And they don't know how to answer an essay about why it's important, except it was all very anti-imperialistly and anti-colonially. And you know, but this is a diplomatic geopolitical conference. Anybody else want to respond to that? I, I can't really think off the top of my head a book that I resisted. As I said, I resisted the whole notion of um, the uh, um, the nationalist historiographies that I was taught and instilled in me for so long that I really wanted to understand why people be harbor racial thoughts. Where does that come from? And I think I took that for granted. And we were always taught the Japanese hate us, um, they look down on us, and that I just heard that wasn't true. Um, so, you know, going back to that past um, of how to understand when people dominate others, what goes through their mind, and uh, apart from the very simplistic notions of racial denigration, mm -hmm. there's a lot of interaction there that we still don't understand the intimacies of living in a majority colonized population, also understanding that population through categories that they, uh, that define their thinking. And it's very hard for them to go beyond that. And having interviewed a lot of Pien Noir, they're very frank about how they feel about Arabs or Algerians. And they have no real um, inhibitions about telling other people how they really feel because they feel they've been the victims 
of a political shift. So I was fascinated by that when we call people racist and we call people, um, uh, you know, in our own way to try to subvert those thinking. We getting in the mindset of those people is a very difficult task, and I think that we still fall short of that sometimes. Mm. New keyword. Um, I was thinking about this with the Macron slide and how more than one of you started to talk about teaching. Uh, and when we're teaching decolonization, my keyword is generations. Uh, <laughs> when we're teaching decolonization, we're now teaching it to a generation of students who are clearly born uh, for almost exclusively very much after the era of formal decolonization and potentially their parents also were born after that period and we're all often still writing in a space of an absence from a generation that was born very much in a period of formal colonization. Um, so I was wondering, how do we deal with generations, both in terms of teaching this subject, but then also, I, I know from reading some of your work, there is also a question of generations within the subject itself. Mm -hmm. Um, I may have a very different population of students than other people. I teach at a large state university in South Florida where we have a lot of Cubans, Cuban exiles, and they are like desperately attracted to these questions. Um, my students, like their favorite text ever is to read Fanon, Wretched of the Earth. They're, I mean, they're, they just like thrive on this stuff. Um, the fact that like nobody's ever taught them about colonialism, nobody's ever taught them anything that's like non Western history, and I mean, these are their favorite classes and things they like really sort of thrive on. And especially, I mean, the Cuban students in particular have most of, in Tampa, it's very interesting, the Miami Cubans are very different than the Tampa Cubans. And so we have a lot of interesting debates about um, Cuban history and, and in particular, that's why Jeff's book's kind of fun to teach and thinking about what Jeff's stuff does in connection with Algerian history and these kind of international questions about Third worldism and, and decolonization really brings up a lot of interesting debates and questions about their own heritage and, and things like that. So for me, it's never been an issue, but I know that it, it certainly may be for other other people. I think what I found interesting because I, I don't teach uniquely on decolonization. I teach courses that cover sort of um, empire since 1830, but that includes a focus on decolonization and also on legacies. And every now and again, I have a class of students when we have a whole day talking about the 2005 law, don't see what the problem was um, and think that this was seems like a reasonable thing to propose, um, which makes me question everything I have taught them up until that point <laughs> in the semester. Um, but it is, it's, I think it's a generational thing, but there's also that distancing. Uh, and so for American students, um, to be engaging with these questions of French empire and French decolonization, uh, they, they bring with them a very different perspective. Um, and it's, it varies group to group. I mean, there's also either an uncanny ability to um, match American exceptionalism with French exceptionalism or an uncanny ability to ignore all of those points of comparison. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it is, there's that challenge too of the distance and of you know people who've actually never thought about French Empire, let alone decolonization. Yeah, so I'd like to introduce another key term um, that I think Sung just used the first time in just a moment ago, which I think is somewhat telling, and that's race, um, which is in some ways underneath everything that we're all doing, but I don't know that we always sort of bring it forward. And part of this is this totally selfish plea to help me think through something in this weird left turn I took in the archives a couple uh, summers ago. But, but trying to think through the moment of the Cold War, but also to take very seriously the ideologies of imperial and, and racial hierarchy, sorry, sorry, imperial and racial ideologies, how important those are in deforming this, and how looking at decolonization can help us, especially when looking at decolonization helps us see ways that race is covered up in these. And I think some of what Katie was saying speaks directly to this, so maybe <laughs> start. But yeah, I think there are probably five or six different directions we could go, or I could go with that question. Um, certainly, I, I, the Cold War context, again, during the war and after, does it obscures uh, those 
in some ways, not entirely, it can't uh, obscures those racial hierarchies, but for example, the typology changes during the war, so you have les Viet, who are the bad guys, and les Vietnamiens, who are the good guys. Uh, and so it's, it's no longer, like the, the, the colonial hierarchies that are largely race-based are still there, but you have now this different way of understanding or perceiving um, the situation on the ground. Uh, and of course, Viet is an incredibly pejorative term to be using, um, but this, I think you see new systems of understanding that are, are significant. And even coming back to what I mentioned previously about m my repatriates as opposed to um, those coming from North Africa, uh, there you see the identity politics playing out. So initially perceived as refugees or as others um, racially and in other ways, uh, but that slowly they become more and more French as other groups are defined as less and less French. Sorry, um, go ahead. One, two, three, <laughs> I guess. Hi, uh, thanks for that. I'm uh, Marco Durante. Um, so I'm not primarily a historian of empire. I, I work on um, French conservatism and uh, the European project. Um, but I was wondering about these political categories of left and right, and to what extent we can map on these political categories, the ones we, when we talk about the metropole onto the colonial scene. So obviously you have, uh, you know, especially, I mean, after the Second World War, elections to the Assembly of the French Union and the National Assembly, and there are, you know, people aligned with different political parties. But in, in, I'm particularly interested, like, what does it mean to be a conservative in the context of the colonies? I and mean, we think of we think of Europe. You think conservatism is often affiliated with people who are often deeply religious. You know, it might be like social Catholics in France or something. What do we do then in the colonies if you have you know people who are attached to uh, the Muslim faith or certain kinds of traditions and trying to blend those in with, uh, you know, maybe maybe nationalism and other and other elements of anti-colonial ideology. That sounds like Jeff. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't think, um, I suppose I'm trying to think both in terms of sort of France and Algeria and in a, in a broader sense. I, I don't think left and right matches onto these things that uh, well. I mean, quite famously or notoriously, the uh, French Communist Party um, was very, you know, took a while for it to come around to the notion of Algerian uh, nationalism uh, and independence. And then you have uh, a lot of sort of, um, in some ways, very right, right wing forces that were actually prosecuting the war, but in some ways become quite, uh, on the French side, become quite radical and sort of um, feel like they're trying to um, make real those notions of a sort of, you know, proper sort of Euro freak that, you know, the Pain War or others got in the way of, sort of an actual, you know, actually saving empire and making it something. Uh, good and constructive. Um, uh, so I don't think it matches up um, all that well, uh, at least in that uh, particular context. I think it's, um, yeah, I mean, I think probably categories like uh, race uh, are better at explaining these things than people's supposed alignment on the political spectrum. Yeah, thanks a lot so much. Uh, thank you so much for these, this panel. Um, so I guess I had one question about um, France. Uh, and so France uh, as both, you know, a country that, uh, how do you see, or do, are you seeing your work shape, I mean, how important is it to you to speak to French history, uh, to make claims that your stories change French history, but also in in part of what's exciting about where people have been or going, and of course Jeff, you're from a different place here, but um, is you know also connecting with historiographies uh, and discussions that are anchored you know pretty solidly outside of France, uh, whether religious histories or others. So, so I wanted to ask you know what you're thinking is then both about you know what how important is it to sit to make l claims that are not larger claims but are specifically about the French nation state, let's say, about how your histories help us think differently about it, but then also historiographically, for those of you who come out of a French historical um, sh training, you know, are you finding yourself still, obviously you're here, we th I'm pleased about that, uh, <laughs> but you know, how, how, how much are you 
being engaged, engaging with other discussions. Uh, and then partly in, you know, in connection with that, but also in connection to the generations question, um, I was thinking about gender, so less about its absence from today's discussion, but also, but in part about uh, one of the one of the things that I think that empire and the turn, the imperial turn did was save French history jobs, um, you know, in this country, uh, and to allow people to explain to their to colleagues, well. Yeah, I should get hired because I also teach about this, but you can also understand that what I say really matters because you've heard of the French Revolution uh, and you've heard of these things that are associated with universalism uh, or you know these stories. So it's not only about Vietnam or it's not only about Algeria or it's not only about, which is what it is, uh, but it seems to me accurate. But, you know, Engender did that in many ways for both us, the same set of series of incredibly important stories uh, that needed to be told and analyses that had been not grappled with and ignored, uh, but also to make French history a space where for many, many people, uh, and not just because of Bonnie Smith and Joan Scott and Lynn Hunt and, and so many others who were doing, and Judy Coffin and tons of other people who were doing such innovative work that was beyond French history, you know, shaped discussions, uh, but methodologically, you know, drew people's attention. And so I was wondering what your thinking is of the connection between, is it worth thinking about the connections between, you know, this approach, which is novel in French history, to what was in many ways the kind of big central discussion in French history in the 90s, you're right before you got there. Um, I'm not sure if that's totally coherent. But. Oh yeah, okay, I will jump in and start. Um, I feel like a lot of my, my work was engaged with, in some ways, more the French historiography than the English, Anglophone historiography, is my, my sort of pushback with the um, histori historiography of Christianity was almost entirely centered in the Francophone historiography, which was all centered around what Christians were doing in France, and a lot of the same thing with the intellectuals, although some of it was Anglophone, but a lot of it was, was French. And then I think there's also um, a discussion around a methodology of, of how we study, in particular, the history of Algeria, um, that a lot of it was based around these kinds of you know, local social history approaches and whether or not that was, could be kind of globalized, right? What is it, what is it to study? both what's happening on the ground, this relationship between what's happening in France, in Algeria, and then on a bigger scale. So for me, it was both these kinds of discussions that were around a historiography taking place in France, taking place in Algeria to a certain extent, but then also these kinds of bigger questions about what, is this, what does this matter on a bigger scale? Like, what does it matter to people who are studying liberation theology, or what does it matter to people who are studying Vatican II and these bigger questions? So I'm, I hope that you know it is still relevant to to French historiography, both in France and for those of us doing Anglophone questions. But then also, like, I kind of end the book thinking about this, even though it's not a book about secularism. Hopefully, it helps us to think through what the history of religion has mattered in these other conflicts, including World War II and in the Algerian War. So that it's not simply this, like, you know, Republican laicite depuis 1940 or whatever. Um, so I am trying to speak to these broader kinds of global questions. And in terms of gender, I mean, I think that the kinds of questions that gender brought up and allowed us to think about and sort of these even just like making us think in post-structural and cultural historical categories enabled us to take this global turn and certainly inform the way that I do history in general. So I, um, yeah. I, I, mean, I think other people could probably speak to that better than I'm doing right now, <laughs> so I'll shut up. Uh, well, I suppose the, the quick observation I would make I mean, in terms of historiography and literatures, I mean, I suppose I came to it originally from sort of, I mean, I thought I was going to write about the Soviet Union um, and somehow ended up in uh, North Africa. So, you know, reading French and Algerian stuff, but also a lot of, a, a lot of sort of uh, international relations, Cold War stuff, but then increasingly African history and uh, Middle Eastern history. Uh, but what's interesting about those is the, uh, and, and the, the comment I had to make is when you were talking about jobs and people uh, defining themselves for jobs, is that there's, it's interesting to see how um, the different political 
baggage that comes with all these contexts, African history, Middle Eastern history, and people are asking different questions. And you go to different conferences, and it's not just that they're necessarily talking about different parts of the world, or in the case of Algeria, it's the same part of the world, but people are asking totally different questions in these different contexts. Uh, and in terms of sort of Europeanists, people who do France or Britain, you know, writing the, uh, as I think someone was also referring to earlier this morning, you know, writing a second book about empire or so on, and you know, saving French history jobs that way. Uh, in terms of decolonizing history, <laughs> in, uh, amongst people who do African history and so on, this is, seems kind of because you're kind of having your cake and eating it too. All the Europeanists of who there's going to be loads of old Europeanists in the department, so they'll automatically relate to what you have, but then you're adding the sort of African angle and you're actually at an advantage in terms of winning votes compared to someone who's just sort of coming from African history. Mm. Uh, I'm not blaming anyone particularly, but it's, <laughs> but you know, the, these, it's interesting to see how these, uh, I mean, this is something that people talk about and complain about. It's it kind of, it's, it's, it's uh, interestingly enough in sort of a, the, in terms of the historical profession, it's actually repeating and continuing that uh, hegemonic, um, um, What's the word I'm, I'm looking for? It's sort of uh, benefit that um, you know Europe has. Um, perhaps did not express that very eloquently, but <laughs> go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that I don't think any one of us would claim that the four books here represent the most recent current and trend in decolonization studies. I think it's a slither of a much larger set of projects that are going on, as this, uh, the audience can attest to. Um, and so um, I did think about, wait, we don't have a single book on gender. That's very true. But I think most of us, um, well, when we come to a project, um, a lot of it is shaped by what culture we've been interested in and, and um, intrigued by, and France was that for me. I didn't come to it thinking I'm going to write the book on repatriation or um, decolonization. There's something about France that intrigued me. Which one of the questions was um, uh, a recurring question that a lot of us work on is when, when was France born? When was when was a French nation created? Was it 1789? Was it 1962? Was it um, even before? Was there a France? And those kind of questions then lead us to ask more questions about what is a nation. And then, of course, those questions intersect with other questions that we're interested in, whether it's gender or whether it's class or race. Um, and we tend to then cross-read those currents to see what kind of questions we that really drive our passions about studying. Um, but, but it's true. I think still we're still very much in the mindset of a national framework. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's how we ask those questions and what come out of those questions that are really um, important. There's one last question. Uh, mostly for Professors Fontaine and Choi, um, and it's about uh, the role of what happened in Algeria after July 1st, 1962, and the politics of repatriation staying memory. Uh, so not just the violence in the first days or the appropriation of European and Jewish property by the Algerian government before the Evian Accord date was set, but also in March 1963, the um, Algerian National Assembly passed a citizenship law that said Christians and Jews, well, non-Muslims to put it, um, are second class citizens, which evidently is not this secular idea that you once heard of the FLN at the United Nations. So. What was the, the role for those who went to France to say, see, look what happened here, or those who stayed? Yeah, well, I think there were, there were at that point, uh, in, initially after 1962, there were, there were 16 Europeans in the National Assembly, and then it went down to three or four, in particular because of the ways that the citizenship laws um, were affected and who could be an Algerian citizenship who could be an Algerian citizen and who could be on the National Assembly. And I think a lot of that, you know, there was a lot of bad blood in 1962, 1963 and thinking about the debates about who could, who could be what and who could stay and all those kinds of things that it, yeah, obviously it didn't turn out like a lot of people wanted and a lot of people ended up leaving. And so I, one of my points that I try to make is that, you know, we don't know. Things could have been different, I think, if people made choices 
to stay or to go. Um, but a lot of people actually did make a choice to stay, right? And they tried to do these things and they tried to participate in the reconstruction of the country after the war, including, you know, participating in the National Assembly, being in elected positions as Europeans, right? Whether they took Algerian citizenship or not. Um, and it turned out okay for some of them and it didn't turn out okay for others, right? But I don't think there was this kind of universal idea that everybody was gonna get killed, everybody's property was gonna be taken away, they were gonna be raped and murdered and kidnapped and all these kinds of things, that, which is the narrative that has long been in existence. Um, I guess I, I wasn't quite sure what the first part of your question was. Um, and also I'm, I'm actually not as versed as I should be in the Algerian post-1962 side of the story. Um, probably Jeff can answer that much better than I can. I'll just add that in a lot of interviews that I did uh, with the Pianoir, um, yeah, that was one of the kind of recurring themes that, look what happened once we left. Um, what a disaster it's become. And they, you know, this is what happens when, you know, you leave affairs to the Algerians, kind of. That was a common thing I heard. Jeff, do you want to? Um, uh, I'm not sure if I have anything to add to that. Uh, at the moment, I'm still um, ruminating on it. Um, I mean, I think things take a very different turn precisely because the Pierre Noir do all leave. And they leave extremely bitterly and wreck what they can. Um, so that changes the um, dynamics. Uh, and empowers the people who would be inclined to um, uh, make the Algerian identity and citizenship much more um, uh, oriented along those lines. And I'm coming at, I don't do any of this research, right? But I teach classes, right? And in teaching classes, so something, I think about voices, I think about post-colonial voices and post-colonial authors. So I've got this thing that I'm putting together that I'm, like I'm trying to um, pair uh, Kamel Daoud's or so investigation with, with, you know, with Camus and, um, and uh, Viet Tan Anwen's The Sympathizer with the Other American by Graham Greene, things like this, where something was written earlier, and then there's a post-colonial author who's writing much more contemporary, right, now, and it's in dialogue with these earlier novels, and sort of expanding the voices. I'm sort of trying to move France. Like I don't care about France in that. I'm, I'm caring about these, these voices that I'm hearing, the, the post-colonial voices. So. I don't know. I just I just toss that out. What do you think of that? First of all, <laughs> am I doing am I doing something that sounds like it's uh, productive or or is it like yeah that's kind of okay but you're not going to get very far that way. I don't I don't know. It sounds really fun. Yeah. I did yes. enjoy that class. <laughs> nervous conditions with uh, they had a direct response, but I think it's in dialogue with Doris Lessons and the last scene. So Rhodesia two British stories. I think that sounds very interesting. Um, okay. and okay. probably, you know, productive and the first time you'll teach it you'll see what emerges and maybe yeah. <laughs> uh, progress from there. But We have time for one more, yeah. Um, I just have a quick question about um, languages. I'm a second year PhD student, so I'm sort of, this is something that I'm thinking about a lot and trying to um, think about how to do a dissertation. One of the things that I've read about a lot in um, like post-colonial studies and things like that is um, the, the problem of using like the sort of imperial language to tell stories of decolonization and things like that. And I think that that's real and I'm wondering um, to what extent that has come up in your research but also like how you see a movement towards using more languages as like making the field of French history sort of evolve. Like is it still sort of exclusively French history? Like thinking about like 
um, what um, uh, Jeff was saying about like the the problem of um, becoming a sort like sort of ex extending the hegemonic control of like European history over um, like these stories of um, colonization and things like that. So I, I'm it's sort of a question about like where you see this like leading the field, but also um, just how it's played into your work. I think that's a great question, um, especially for, uh, for Algerian history. It's becoming, I think, more and more important and necessary to have good Arabic skills. Uh, my research was almost entirely in French because I was writing about Christians, and it ended up focusing mostly on like archives and archdiocese and that kind of thing, and then French archives. But like most of the really good young scholars now are are doing a lot of field work in Algeria and and a lot of archival work with Arabic sources, and it's. I think becoming necessary to have good Arabic skills. Um, I think Mariam and I don't know who else in the room could speak to that, but but I think probably would agree with that. I don't know if you would agree about that. Um, well, I started out with better Russian than French, um, and I always was going to go to the Moscow archives for that, but it didn't quite happen. Um, but uh, I mean, I didn't start studying Arabic until sort of when I was doing the PhD. And interestingly, I mean, itself, it depends what project you're doing. Actually, for, for this project, I wouldn't have been able to do it without French. Um, and there's not a lot of Arabic stuff. And, and that's reflective of the um, uh, Algerian sources themselves, the type of stuff I was looking at. Uh, I mean, I saw stuff up until the 1980s, and nearly all of their internal communications are still in French, um, including little notes on things from the current president, uh, for example, saying, if something sort of was in Arabic, be like, translate this bloody thing. Because it was obviously still a pain for him to read it uh, in Arabic. He'd rather mm. read it in French. Um, it sort of seemed to depend um, on the ministry. Um, I think the sort of cultural ministry started to transition internally to Arabic more earlier. I suspect things like the foreign ministry still run on French um, internally. I'm not sure if actually that really answers your question. But. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else want to? <laughs> no, I mean, I think I, I'll echo what, what Darcy said as well about the importance of, of having that, the language of the other side of the equation, but it also depends on your project. So many of us were focusing specifically on, I mean, in my case, I was focusing on what's happening in France. And the odd, there was the odd document here and there, especially connected to the repatriates that might have had some sections in uh, Vietnamese, and I did study Vietnamese. I'm by no means fluent. Um, and that, I think, is something to, it's something to pursue um, as an important part of, of your own education, and the earlier the better, frankly. <laughs> um, but it, it, you know, there are, there are, I think, still ways of doing these histories, um, relying more on the colonizer's language, but I do think that there are more and more uh, approaches and studies and areas of focus that require a multilingual mm -hmm. set of skills. Politics is all this can be a bit oppressive too, though, sometimes. But I, don't know. I think that's all the time that we have. So I just want to thank the four of you and all of you for thank coming. You. You're awesome.